Okay, so here's the final uh, part of this particular um, unit, and it describes the subgroup that uh, I was the leader of requirements and use case subgroup. <coughs> So we have a we have most of the some of the usual verbiage at the top about working with industry, academia, and government, and we're trying to find requirements. And the process of getting requirements was done by first getting use cases and extracting requirements from use cases. This, this is not the only way of getting requirements. But it's a way that is documentable. Because once you have a use case, which is sort of by definition real, and is documented, then if it has requirements, you know why you have that requirement. And if you don't meet that requirement, you know what you're going to lose. So we had gathered our 51 new cases. We found some requirements. Uh, one little minor little difficulty, which um, will be corrected in uh, hopefully as the process moves on, is in some sense, those requirements should should drive the reference architecture. But the requirements really didn't finish until towards uh, the middle of September. And so they little, really couldn't drive the technology, uh, the reference architecture. Uh, so the reference architecture, was, which should in some sense have followed the uh, Requirements process was done in parallel with the requirements process. That was the correct decision, but it has some consequences. Um, so, <clears throat> at the time, this was a slide for essentially summarizing what we did on September 30th. At the time, we decided on September 30th, we agreed to actually a next step was to look at general patterns. Some of that uh, I've, I've already done. And will be presented in the next unit when we look at the uh, different different um, features of the use cases. Something which has not been done is to validate the requirements and reference architecture by implementing some of these patterns. And the, and the idea of the patterns is, and, and we actually have not actually implemented any patterns, so in some sense there's this clearly still to do, is it is not realistic to develop, uh, to actually implement a, in a generic fashion, a real application, you need to find an app, an application paradigm or pattern, which you implement in, in generic fashion, which can be done relatively simply, and use that to evaluate the reference architecture. Uh, so a key part of the, um, that may be the major part of the whole use case of working group, or maybe it's only it's only contribution to knowledge was the development of a, of a one page word document which had which was a use case template it was one the empty template was one page the full the full, full templates can be many pages so this just defines what we collect for each use case the title the area where that uh, use case lives in the military or um, retail or Artificial intelligence, the people doing the um, building the uh, use case um, definition, which may or may not be the same people who actually execute it. The people involved, um, which will be the users of this use case, the developers of the use case, and the supporters of the use case. The goals of the use case, and find out fundamental scientific results. Description of the use case, how you got those scientific results. And then after these, these general rules, we come into some of the technical details. Um, and here was the discussion of how it's done today. What the compute system's like, what the storage is like, what the network is like, what the software is like. And then <coughs> we now have, that's the sort of the infrastructure, now we come to the actual big data itself. Where the data comes from, the size, the velocity, the variety is the three major Vs. And there's the, um, as well as uh, we also have the variability, the rate of change of the uh, data. Um, which is, So here we use variety to, to, men, to, to describe uh, how it, um, the different the number of types of data and the variability 
is uh, the change in the size and nature of the data. And what he said is constant in time. Um, then we come to uh, veracity, which is the robustness and the semantics of the of the data. We have the visualization of the data, the quality. Um, quality uh, is um, and veracity address different uh, different uh, aspects of uh, saying um, correctness uh, issues. One at the semantic level, and one at the actual um, data value level. Um, then we have the actual types of data, and here we have a pretty important field, the actual analytics, which needs is being used or should be used. After these uh, description, we then have the um, um, data challenges. These are the sort of free field comments. Uh, anything, uh, comments on the importance of mobile phones? We know mobile phones are growing in importance, in, at least in the real world. And the PCs are declining in use, and mobile phones are dramatically increasing. Although this lecture has been done on a PC, so still PCs have some value. And by PCs, I meant any laptop or desktop. This is a laptop. And then we have the security and privacy issues, which is cross cutting, so we put it uh, outside the main details. Uh, <coughs> and then any comments they would have on the special features. And then at the end, some URLs and the final free field comment, which is rarely filled in. So we have 26 fields, and we have 51 uh, completed uh, surveys, which we will come to in the next unit. And they we divide them into these broad areas, government operation for, for the uh, 51. Eight of the 51 were commercial uh, use cases, three were defense. Ten were in healthcare and life sciences. Some of those, in some sense, are um, they might necessarily research applications. They could actually be operational applications in the healthcare industry. So there are some commercial. Things. Then we have a pretty exciting area: deep learning, where a lot of the progress has been made in analytics and then social media analysis. Those are two very hot areas which we join together. Then we have four, which I call the ecosystem for research, because they describe general features, cross-cutting use cases. You'll see what they what they are when we come to them. They're a bit of a grab bag, but when you have use cases need ecosystem. I mean, research and big data needs an ecosystem. Uh, then we have five in astronomy and physics, and ten in sort of earth, environmental, and polar science, and then one in energy. These numbers should not be taken seriously as to the importance of big data in certain areas. They just represent who filled in our um, in our form, and this was all done over roughly six weeks because we didn't really have the form till the middle of July, and then we want then we started winding down the process at the end of August because we had to summarize it and things like that. So this is six weeks of intense activity to gather these, these use cases. Um, so this, uh, this slide here tells you what those use cases were. Government operations, we had sensors, National Archives and Records Administration uh, as, as particular examples. We had um, commercial finance backup, citation analysis for the company Mendeley. Netflix or streaming uh, streaming video, web search, um, cargo shipping, as in UPS, an example of the Internet of Things, and the whole issue, an uh, important area of um, materials and manufacturing and the aspect of digital technology there. Defense covered sensors, surveillance, situation assessment, and a key feature of that, which I already mentioned, was the importance of images. There's several important uh, defense uh, sensors that gather very large images, which have huge, significant big data challenges. Healthcare and life sciences, we saw medical records, uh, different ways of analyzing that data, very ingenious analytics. Pathology, the study of, um, of images, <coughs> the actual taking the images of, in, by, by uh, radiating. Um, um, biology samples, genomics obviously is a, 
We know how, how you know, sequencing the gene has made such progress. Epidemiology, the study of, um, of disease and populations, the impact of that on population, or just the study of populations and how they react to crises like uh, terrorism and things like that. That involves making models of people's activity and uh, that, that data, a very rich set of uh, generated data. And we also had an application in the biodiversity area. In deep learning and social media, we uh, the use cases describe identifying faces, driving cars, geolocating images, analysis of Twitter, crowdsourcing, the general area of network science, and uh, an important, a nice uh, NIST example where uh, they they are actually responsible for many benchmark data sets, such as in uh, translation, um, image identification, and things like that, and how, how those uh, benchmark data sets are used. In the ecosystem for research, this grab bag, we have things about metadata, um, collaboration, which you must do to uh, do any large big data problem, language translation, and uh, analysis of um, literature, and also just a rather different case, namely the actual uh, light source um, beam lines, which are used for um, many of these image-based applications. In astronomy and physics, well, there was a, lots of a, very interesting work on sky surveys, gathering lots of data, comparing data taken at different wavelengths, comparing it with simulations. We had a couple of accelerator applications, one from Japan and one from the Big Large Hadron Collider of Sun. Earth, environmental, and polar science are noted for studying real three dimensional um, manifestations. And that's done by scattering radar in the atmosphere to the study of the atmosphere, looking at data related to earthquakes, what happened after an earthquake, or what, what might be a signal of earthquakes, uh, observing the ocean and the earth. Um, Looking at ice sheets to try to understand uh, why what's happening to the North and South Poles. Mapping the Earth with radar, uh, climate simulation. The data, big data can come not just from observation, it comes from large computers. Nifty example of how uh, NASA is looking at uh, atmospheric turbulence with images and identifying, uh, uh, and, and identifying uh, Interesting features which are used then to um, help pilots avoid them. Uh, a lot of work in the environmental area, linking sensors and all the different components together, microbes to watersheds. And Meriflux and Fluxnet are big sensor networks. And then our single energy application is involves a very critical one, the smart grid, a very, very important. Uh, Example of how information technology and data can potentially make a big impact to everybody. Here is an example of one of the tables in the final report. <coughs> if we look across here, each of these rows is a summary of some information about one of the use cases. So here we have use case 23. Bother. Uh, Use case 23 is uh, documented in um, document 172. It's about epidemiology. The data size is, um, remember here we have the, the uh, label is at the bottom, volume 100 terabytes. Here is the velocity of the data, the variety of the data, the software used as one uses classic HPC software, Charm++ and MPI. And then what type of analytics is needed? Here we're doing simulations on synthetic population. The big data is the synthetic population. Here is a related um, um, population study, social uh, contagion uh, modeling of planning how to deal with um, terrorism or events like 9-11 and things like that. Biodiversity is well known to be an important issue. Life Watch is a European project in that area. And so we have its properties here. It uses relational databases. So we had all sorts of technologies here, not just um, uh, 
not just uh, modern cloud technology, but also traditional technology, because you need this. It's not there's no one solution to all problems. Here we have deep learning, which involved GPUs and high performance computing. To, um, and it has the particular application, say, designing a self driving car by letting, letting it learn from lots of images, could involve 100 million images. Um, here we have an application, in, here's a document here, 171. Uh, this involves potentially huge numbers of, of images, then the ones uploaded to Facebook and Flickr and, um, and Snapchat. And of course, we know that changes very rapidly. There are 500 billion now. There are 500 million uploaded every day. And uh, there are all sorts of little uh, variety there. And this is trying to geolocate all these images by matching them. And that's effectively solved as the analytics, the large scale nonlinear least squares, and um, support vector machines, and it uses MapReduce as the actual software. So this is, so this is just, uh, this is a summary. And it is a summary in terms of features. It's just a few of the key features, six of them, five of them, I should say, or well, five analytic features, and then one label feature. And uh, here we have the final one is the Twitter analysis using a dupe uh, H base with indexing added to it. And it compared various forms of NoSQL, including an H base with found to be the most appropriate. And it's looking for anomalies and communities from Twitter data. So here we have, um, this. there's a lot of information here, and this is just meant to give you a feeling as to what you can find out. Now we actually give some details about how requirements were extracted from the use cases, or rather I should say from the use case templates. All 51 templates were gone through and the particular the same process and with slight variations because it was done by several people and people used different approaches was was applied to each use case. So basically, we identify some categories such as data sources, lifecycle management, transformation capability, data uses, security, and privacy. And those categories were a way we gathered the requirements together. Then we identified ahead of time which of the fields in the template might be likely to drive these particular global categories. And so which of the global categories are more motivated by the reference architecture diagram. Uh, we have slightly different terminology from the reference architecture diagram, where those transformation is still used in the, in the reference architecture because uh, these, were, these uh, words here for the overall um, Category where we're going to put things in um, was developed before the reference architecture was finalized. So we divide specific requirements, categorized uh, as described into these various high level um, buckets. And then we took the specific requirements, uh, which come from particular use cases, and aggregated them into general requirements. I would say that's the least certain part of what we did, because really to do that, you need to actually know what the reference architecture needs. And we didn't have time to, to, to do that. So I would say that part, step two, is likely to get redone at some stage. So we had 437 requirements, uh, which we extracted um, <coughs> from the 51 use cases. And as I say, this is hardly an exact science because um, one person's you know, in a given requirement can be written as one requirement or three requirements, depending on its granularity. And the types of requirements which you can get are software needs R, software needs MATLAB or Hadoop, and so on. Um, <coughs> You need to be able to update the data every 15 minutes, or the analysis of the data every 15 minutes. Need to transfer the data from the accelerator from Japan to the computer in the US, and so on. Uh, here we have need a lot of provenance. 
real time and batch mode both people. So these are typical requirements uh, which we identified. So this all seems trivial, but uh, when you take 51 uh, use cases, 51 times trivial time adds up to a sizable amount of time. And so uh, although it looks very easy, it turned out to uh, be quite difficult in detail. And we need to try to automate some of these processes that might require redesigning the, the template so it's more clearly mappable into the reference architecture. But to, before we do that, I think we should actually um, check the reference architecture to see it's uh, stated in the most precise fashion. All of this is up on this website here. Uh, if you go to that use cases website on the NIST, uh, NIST you will find uh, the template which we discussed in detail. Uh, we'll have a readable summary with these, um, which every use case has, a, has the application described, the current approach described, and the uh, futures given. And there's also sometimes a picture. Um, then there is uh, digest, which is what I actually um, showed you a, a subset of, which has the three Vs, volume, velocity, variety, software, and data analytics, the five, these five key characteristics. Then we have for each use case, a set of specific requirements, and due to the way it was done, these were sometimes tied to the use case very clearly, or sometimes just stated without the, the tie being explicit. And then we had a link between specific requirements and general requirements. So here is um, uh, some comments on the uh, General requirements. So we found 35 general requirements, which are organized into seven categories. Uh, so, uh, for instance, um, here are some transformation general requirements, and um, 38 specific requirements are summarized as a general requirement need to support diversified compute intensive analytic processing machine learning techniques. Here we have seven Pacific requirements, and by Pacific, I mean they come from different use cases. They may not be stated in the same way for each use case, but they were mapped into the same general requirement, need to support batch and real-time analytic processing. So, and here we have need to support processing of large diversified data content and modeling. 15 Pacific requirements are mapped to that general requirement. Need to support data and motions. This is the streaming thing. Six use cases had that. So those are how the 35 general requirements were. And these are four of the 35 uh, as an example. Just as an example of um, this process is non-trivial in size. We have, um, if you look at the actual report, I don't know that NIST has decided whether to put this report in as a document or as a, with all 264 pages or as a summary as part of it and then some of the rest like the actual, this includes all the temp filled in templates, but the rest just on the website. We had the 35 general requirements, the uh, 437 Pacific requirements, which are what averages to 8.6 uh, um, Specific requirements per use case and 12.5 specific requirements per general requirement. Data sources, um, we have three general data sources requirements and 78 specific. Transformation, um, uh, we have four general and 60 specific. Capability or infrastructure, we have six general, 133 specific. Data consumer, six general, 55 Pacific. Security and privacy, two general, 45 Pacific. Life cycle, nine general, 43 Pacific. And other, which is a sort of bucket for things we didn't know what to do with, five general, 23 Pacific. And I explained how we put them in these categories in, in an earlier slide, and how different fields of the use case template nationally mapped into these different uh, red categories here. But 
but it was all done by a person, not automated, so the person could make a decision to violate the general the, the, the rule. But uh, if you're going to do this at any greater volume than 51, you're going to need to find some automatic way of doing this. So here are some important uh, web resources. This is the one I've already given the use case to our website. Um, Here's the specific requirements for each use case. The general requirements versus architecture component. General component uh, versus architecture component with the record of the use cases giving that requirement. And the architecture component is the specific requirements plus the use case constraining this component. So these various um, websites give you the detail, the rich detail which you can use to make um, get some understanding as to how these different use cases uh, fit together, they drive the reference architecture, and, to, and so to what extent are the key challenges are needed. So here's a little comment on the next steps. Well, we're, uh, this is the next steps for this particular use case and requirements uh, subgroup. We've more or less agreed on the current draft material, um, and we've actually got the feedback from most of the submitters. This evaluation of the requirements I think will be done in version two, not in version one. Because until we get a more thorough understanding of the reference architecture from specific examples, I don't think this makes sense. And it will take us a long time, quite many months to do a good job on the uh, mapping use cases to reference architecture and looking at the pluses and minuses of that. If we want to collect more use cases, which is not clear at present, because given we haven't fully processed or run out of the current use cases, it's not clear we need more. We need to automate that if we want to do more with some sort of web resource. So that's where we are. Next step, publication of what we have, and do this mapping between use cases and architecture. Next step for this class is study of the 51 use cases.